Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Amplify Your Business. Today, we're going to be talking about algae, eating algae, in fact. And so this is going to be a really interesting conversation with Alessandra Amato from Algae Foods. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. So like I said at the top, we're going to be talking about eating algae. So this business that you've started is just absolutely fascinating to me. So let's go right to the very beginning and explain how did we end up, you know, with a business in which you are feeding people algae based foods? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I started Algae with my business partner and co-founder, Devin. Um, we were both students at Queen's University and didn't know each other at the time and both had no idea what we wanted to do with our lives. So we decided to participate in a program, an innovation program that was hosted by Queen's um, over the summer after we finished our undergraduate degrees. And that's where we met and we really just bonded over our shared passion for food and sustainability. We were also both uh, high performing athletes growing up I figure skated and he uh, did downhill skiing so we really connected over that um, and we're just trying to part as part of the program we really needed to figure out a problem to work on a business that we wanted to kind of get started and just in connecting over this kind of food and sustainability we realized that this was something that we were both really passionate about and so we just started researching um, different alternatives. We weren't even sure we wanted to start a food company, um, but just, you know, how do we tackle the sustainability problems in the food industry? Because uh, the food industry contributes 26% of global greenhouse gas emissions, which is something that I don't think people don't realize like how big of a contributor that it is. Yeah. And just in kind of looking at trends and market analysis and kind of global things that were happening, we discovered algae, uh, specifically spirulina algae. And I think when Devin told me, my first reaction was like, why would I ever want to eat yeah, algae? Yeah, yuck, um, right? <laughs> like, what are you telling me? Um, but we started looking into it and it really hit a lot of, it, it was like incredible. And it was this untapped, you know, nutrition powerhouse. And it really hit a lot of the needs we were both feeling personally. Um, so Devin is vegan and he had been vegan for a few months at that point and just really wasn't satisfied with what he was seeing on the market. He was like, I have to either make a sacrifice on taste, nutrition, or just like quality and, and ingredients because it's all preservatives. Yeah. Um, I was trying to go plant-based, but I'm anemic and I'm allergic to soy. So for me, it was just like, I can't eat anything that's available in the market. And so for us, spirulina really hit that mark where it's uh, really sustainable to grow and it's really high in protein, iron, omegas, tons of vitamins and minerals. Um, and that's really where that kind of light bulb moment of like, are we crazy? Probably, but there's a <laughs> lot of potential here and no one's doing anything with it. Okay. And so you guys then were in this innovation workshop or, or program, you had to come up with an idea. You pick algae as being the answer for the sustainability problem that you wanted to tackle yeah. you decide that it's going to be food-based now um at the start did you know it was going to be uh power bars or was was there some trial and error there where you, you used a bunch of different kinds of foods when you were developing it yeah well i guess our first the first question we had to address was just like is, are we like two just two outliers who are willing to eat this and is this actually something people want so <laughs> yeah. what we did is we we went into Devin's kitchen and like ordered some spirulina online and literally any food we could think of we would try to make it so we made like ramen noodles we made hummus we made pasta like nacho chips cookies like anything we could think of we figured out how we could incorporate spirulina into it just to be like how does this even taste because if you've smelt it or tasted spirulina on its own, I'm not going to lie. It's pretty gross. <laughs> it's uh, <not> good. <laughs> so we were like, can we actually make this palatable? Um, and we could, and we found we were actually very surprised with very little effort. You know, it wasn't fantastic the first ride, but it was actually like pretty decent. And so we then took these products and we just went to the farmer's markets and we just gave stuff away for free because yeah. it would be so green that we were like, that in itself is pretty off-putting. So if people are even willing to try it, that was a win. And then we would get their feedback. And 
then we they'd be like what am i eating and and they would be scared but we would explain it to them and they'd be like oh my gosh this is incredible and so that really answered that first question from us is like do people actually want algae based food products and and yes so what we did from there is we wanted to figure out as you said like what product do we want to go with we do now have an energy bar um but actually at the beginning we were very very against um energy bars we we were like the bar market is so saturated why would we want to do that yeah. um, and we actually were thinking of ramen noodles um so we were kind of like you know we're starving students <laughs> we eat a lot of ramen eat, yeah <laughs> but there's no nutritional value so if yeah. we can make them yeah nutritional like that's a no that's like a no-brainer to us that's like a win situation um yeah we were successful at making them to kind of eat right away but where we were lacking, we don't have any food science background. And so what we were lacking was just this ability to even bring it into the, into the, like where we were working for everyone else to try, like it, it wouldn't even last that long kind of thing. And so we were like, okay, how much is it going to cost us to get a food scientist in to do this? And it was a lot of money that we, and we have no money at this point. We haven't done anything. Um, so we kind of were just trialing and erroring things. Um, we very blindly um, applied to an event in the U.S. called uh, the Smart Kitchen Summit, which does, you know, food technology, uh, both like the actual like appliances and like food preparation, but also just like innovations in food itself. Um, with very much an idea, uh, we somehow were selected as a finalist. So we got to attend this event oh, in cool. Seattle um, and we were like, we need to bring something for people to try like what are we going to do so i think we left on a tuesday and we wednesday before we were like let's figure out how to make bars that's really easy to transport um and <laughs> people just immediately seemed to resonate with the bars in a way that they weren't resonating with anything else um and even some of the feedback we were getting when we were just answering the question of do people want algae-based foods was like i need something that's easier for me to you know, get used to eating algae before I commit to like a bowl of ramen, for example. Yeah. Um, and so as much as we did not want to do bars, um, it was what everyone was asking for and it was what people seemed to click with the most. So we decided to pursue that. Well, and I, and I also imagine too, like with the bars, there's so many more ingredients that you have with the algae that, exactly. yeah, like it's, it's a lot easier as sort of in a way to mask the, the taste of it and so on, right? To really dress it up, so to speak. Yeah, well, and that's like our bars are actually made with one one bar flavor has six ingredients, one bar flavor has seven ingredients. So it's made with very clean and simple ingredients. Mm -hmm. But as you said, like there's a lot more flexibility and we were able to find either flavors that could mask it and it would just be the flavor of the bar or that like complemented it really well. Yeah. And so you're highlighting the good parts of that algae taste. Um, but yeah, exactly. You have a lot more flexibility and a lot more room to play around with what ingredients you're using. Okay, so the other part that I'm fascinated with in this story, it, so you mentioned you guys aren't food scientists, right? Mm -hmm. So that's not your background. So what is the background of you two founding partners? Yeah, so Devin has a dual degree in commerce and global development from Queens. Um, I did my uh, bachelor's degree in kinesiology from Queens, and I'm finishing up my master's degree in kinesiology as well from McGill. So we have a little bit of the commerce and a little bit of the kind of nutrition athletic performance background, but that's kind of the extent of, of where that experience gets us. Yeah, well, and that's where like the power bar really then fits in nicely with your background on the on the kinesiology then a little bit, right? Because you understand that target market and so much better than probably a food scientist would. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We um, we launched the bars in September of 2021, and we went to an event kind of immediately after launching. And someone came up to me and he's like, "I was my legs were cramping like crazy, like I." what I, he's like, I could, nothing I was doing was helping. I ate one of your bars and the cramping immediately stopped. And I was able to be like, well, this vitamin and this mineral did this to this and explain it to him. And, you know, a very high level overview, but he was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And so kind of like convinced him that like, Hey, they actually know what they're talking about a little bit. Yeah, no doubt. So I can totally see how that's going to be beneficial as you guys continue to develop both the product line and, and your marketing strategy, because um, I earlier when we were talking, you were saying that your target audience is, in fact, uh, initially anyway, those athletes, the high performance athletes, right? And so yeah. you you understand them very well. 
Yes. Yes. I think, you know, Devin and I both having the background of being these high performing athletes growing up, but now just like my education background of like actually understanding how the food we're eating is affecting performance and knowing how the bars can best benefit. Um, it's going to be a huge asset to help us kind of resonate and, and market to and explain our products to, to our customers. Yeah. Now I know you said at the very beginning, um, again, in an earlier conversation that we had uh, at the beginning, you weren't necessarily targeting the high performance um, marketplace initially, and you did yeah. eventually get there. I think our audience would enjoy understanding how you, you know, that journey went, uh, what were you initially targeting and how did you decide to pivot uh, to the high performance athlete? Yeah. So as I mentioned at the beginning, like when we first started, we went to farmer's markets and we were just giving products out and seeing what people thought. And in part of that, we were trying to understand like who would want to buy our products and kind of identified five main segments um, of people who, you know, would benefit from it. And they were all completely different. And we were like, how at this point didn't know the idea of like simplifying and just narrowing in and picking one. And we were like, how are we supposed to pick how are we supposed to market to all these people like what are we supposed to do yeah. um and we were we were really just like doing a lot of market research just talking to as many people as we could to see um but then COVID hit and so we everything shut down of course and Devin who was living at Kingston at the time because he was finishing his degree went home to Canmore and uh you know try we're, we're here we we have no idea what the fate of the world is going to look like um we're like, well, we might as well use this downtime to kind of keep building our business because this is something that we want to keep doing. And yep. he was just trying different recipes and was giving them to his parents. His, he was giving them to his friends. His parents were giving them to friends. And being from Canmore, you know, everyone hikes and bikes and runs and does all of these long duration endurance type activities. And people were just like coming back to him and being like, I was on a ride, like I was biking and I thought I was going to die. I remembered I had a bar. I had the bar and it saved me. Like, I feel like I had more energy after I had the bar than when I started. Like, really this cool. is incredible. And I think for us, it was just kind of that like aha moment of like, oh, like this is a great fit for our product. And just because of the nutrition profile of the spirulina itself, it really supports that kind of long lasting energy boost. Not So you're not getting the same crash that you get from sugar. And we were like, this, this makes sense. This is, this is a great fit. And luckily we're kind of right in the heart of where a lot of those activities take place. So it's really easy for us to reach that audience. Yeah. And I, I love the the story that you just shared, because I think there's a lot of businesses that will start out and they've, they've done, you know, tons of research and they really know exactly who their target market is going to be. And they go out to the marketplace and then for whatever reason, maybe they don't get the traction that they thought they were going to get. And then they're really struggling um, and not necessarily listening to the market. And so um, the one thing that we work with uh, our clients on a lot of times is in the digital space, when we're doing marketing, we can do a lot of different testing and the data can basically inform uh, where the best, you know, reach is that we're getting with each target audience, because you get a lot of user information, um, oftentimes, right, or, or purchaser information. And so uh, the same thing you guys applied, but more in a, you know, face to face sort of uh, yeah. environment where you guys were really just listening to those people who are tasting it and testing it and using it initially, and then letting that data that informal gathering of information inform then the market in which is you have the best opportunity for success to target initially right and so I, yeah. I love that you guys were really uh, able to focus in that and really listen to the to the customer or listening to the people who are who are using it so good job on that yeah I think I think that's definitely the one thing we did right from the beginning is just you know we we tried to like I think it was easy because we are coming in from such a new and novel ingredient like there's no kind of predefined like it was really up to us to figure out we're the first company in Canada to do this one of the first globally so it really was up to us to figure out who yeah. that is and so yeah I think we I will say that's one of the things we did right is uh, a lot of just active listening yeah okay so I know in a previous conversation you were telling me as well that you guys were originally going to start the business out in Ontario and then you decided to pivot it to Canmore and so can you walk me through that decision as well 
just because we were at Queens and that's where we started and Queens does have, or Kingston in general, it's really starting to become uh, an, an ecosystem for startups. Um, so we were just kind of like, well, we're here, we're getting good support, we'll just keep going. Um, but, and we were also very close to Toronto, like only like a two or three hour drive. So we we're like, this is great. We'll have access to, you know, this big city and there's tons of resources um, there. But then what we were finding is we were kind of just getting lumped in with the Toronto startups and there's so many there and it's it's a lot and there's not as many resources as you would think when you look at how many startups there actually are. Mm. Um, and so it was just something we were dealing with. And I don't think the idea to, to shift to Alberta ever crossed our minds until Devin went home, came to Canmore, saw the fit and just had like people reaching out to him, like so many people from different organizations. Um, the first one was kind of Innovate Canmore. Um, their director reached out to him um, and was like, if you need any help, let me know. And that for us, he then introduced us to a ton of other people in the Alberta ecosystem. And we just kind of realized like with Alberta trying to diversify away from the oil and gas industry and, and increase their other industries and Calgary is really becoming a tech epicenter. And as a result, the kind of this whole startup ecosystem is growing there was a ton of resources that we were able to do and a ton of just kind of people who were so willing to help whereas I feel like in Toronto or like Ontario you really are like pulling and you're begging for help where and you you can't get through like the mass of people where here it was like I send an email and and you know within two hours I have a response and it's the most helpful response like more than I could have ever asked for and so that for us was just like well we're here and we want to start marketing within Canmore and within, you know, the Calgary area, because it's easier for us because, you know, Devin's here. Um, why, why are we still kind of an Ontario company? And so we decided to make the switch to Alberta. And we've had, um, we've participated in a few programs through kind of Platform Calgary. Um, we've, and we've just had a bunch of help from, you know, Alberta Innovates and, and other just different uh, programs that have been really great to help us grow and, and scale quickly. Yeah. And so I, I find it really interesting. I think a lot of our audience would as well in terms of how you were able to uh, basically get into that startup ecosystem so easily within Alberta and in particular the Calgary region. And I think you'd mentioned that, yeah, you, you were part of Alberta Yield. Um, yeah. Alberta Innovates has been helping you out. There's been other organizations, Camor Innovates and so on. So uh, can you tell me a little bit about what you were able to receive from participating in some of those programs like Alberta Yield? Yeah, so the Alberta Yield program for us was a little bit interesting. Um, I think it really is mainly driven towards kind of farming and, and agriculture and, and all of that kind of, of industries. Um, we were we were part of the first kind of inaugural board, so I do understand they were kind of trying to figure it out. And there were some other kind of food product companies there. Um, but for us, that was really when we had made our switch. So it was more about, um, you know, we had participated in some other you know, startup program. So for us, it was less about like the content and just kind of getting that introduction into the Calgary and Alberta ecosystem, which I think was, it was incredible for that. Um, we did, we did definitely learned lots. Um, but I think the, for us, the biggest takeaway was just, you know, you get connected to one person. And I think this is kind of the beauty of the fact that the startup ecosystem is just starting to grow and isn't as established as that it's still pretty small. And so everyone knows everybody and it's very easy to get connected to the right people because they're like oh let me just connect you and then that person will connect you and it's it's very quick easy to quickly grow your network and I think that's been really helpful because there's definitely been a lot of opportunities a lot of different mentors that we wouldn't have otherwise been connected with and we're now able to kind of ask questions and and get into the right spots and, and meet the right people to help us. Yeah, and I think that that is something where a lot of people would be somewhat intimidated by uh, initially, you know, thinking that, well, you know, my little startup, you know, how do I get exposure into the larger ecosystem? Um, how do I ask for support? Um, do I even feel comfortable asking for, uh, you know, the questions that that would then basically have me uh, be introduced to different people and so on, right? Like, it, it, there's just a lot of uh, discomfort that a lot of people would have uh, thinking that, well, they're just a, a small fish in a bigger pond. Uh, but the reality of it is, is the startup ecosystem is, yeah, it, it, it's a small community 
Uh, it still is, even though it's continuing to grow. But I think you you nailed it in the sense that uh, once you get into it, the network just really starts to spider out. And when there's, you know, when you have a, a great product, uh, some innovation, and you can create some excitement around that, people just really almost trip over each other just to try to help out. And I, I would imagine that that's what you found as well with uh, with your product and your your company. Yeah, absolutely. Like I would say like, I'm still terrified to reach out. Like even people that I've reached out to like tons of times, like I'm still like, I'm so sorry to, but like, it's, it's terrifying and it's still <laughs> terrifying. And I think that's just something like, there's, you just have to do it and there's no way around it and you're never going to feel ready and you just need to push yourself and put yourself out there. So I will say that, yeah. but yeah. I would say like, exactly like and even just not even specific to the kind of calgary startup ecosystem but just you know the startup ecosystem as a whole i found it's to be incredibly supportive and there's like everyone is everyone is in a vulnerable position everyone is you know probably risking a lot and putting a lot on the line for their idea and they want to be successful and i've just found that it's such a like you'd think that everyone would be so competitive. And so like, I want to succeed and people do want to succeed and they do want to be successful in, in their venture. But what I've actually found is that everyone's had help along the way and they're so grateful for the help that they've gotten that they're so willing and eager to kind of give back to those who are yeah. there, like those behind them and help lift them up. And that's something that, you know, I've never experienced anything in any sort of community that I've been involved in. And the the calgary ecosystem itself is is just like is j exactly like that where you know everyone just wants to support each other and we all want to help each other which is honestly surprising because we're half of us are all competitors with each other but so willing to help out and give back and you know just even being a sounding board for each other it's it's incredible and it's it's just really exciting to be a part of yeah. And I know in Edmonton, it's exactly the same thing. And, and for those listeners who are in other uh, regions throughout our country and, and potentially into the States and so on, it, it's going to be the same thing in your communities too. So the big thing is just take that first step, get involved, ask yeah. questions, uh, get it, uh, you know, become part of some of the, the programs that are out there, some of the startup programs, um, the, the incubators and so on. The yeah. The, what you'll learn is going to be really valuable, but what's even more valuable is that broader network that you're going to develop where you can tap into that. How are you marketing your product then so that your target audience does see it? I mean, obviously, if it's in the stores, if it's on the shelf, they're going to see it there. But it's one thing to see a product and it's another thing to actually pick it up, especially in the food category when, you know, you're trying to get somebody to eat algae, right? So they yeah. <laughs> Um, well, sampling in the food industry is kind of the way to go. And typically, I'm sure everyone's seen like at the grocery store, there's a little booth set up, someone's like handing out samples of something. Yep, With sure. COVID, all of that has stopped. So that's kind of, that's always like, whenever you talk to anyone in food, it's always go sample your product at grocery stores. And you're like, I can't do that right now. So <laughs> do that, what no, do no. I do instead? Um, and we've really had to get creative in terms of how we're doing that. So um, just one one of the things is like you know we're based in Canmore so we're at the in the summers we're at the Canmore and Banff farmers market and we're involved in the community and we were at the Banff marathon and just again really just getting ourselves up there uh getting ourselves in front of people is is the way in any way we can do that um we actually did um we have a, a video on our it's on our instagram page right now it's an igtv of it's called the where's your gym shoot is what we called it and it was kind of this with shoulder season happening, but also gyms shutting down with COVID, it was how can we be creative about, you know, working out? And we have an unconventional bar for an unconventional workout. And one of the shots that we did was we decided to carry an erg machine. So like a rowing machine up onto Holling Peak in Canmore uh, <laughs> and do a shoot of someone rowing on the top of the mountain. And that was something for us that was it really like a light bulb moment because we were hiking up the mountain. And of course, everyone was like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> why are you lugging this a thing rowing back? machine? They're like, like the comment was like, is this not hard enough for you? Like you're hiking up a mountain. Is that not hard enough? Like you need to <laughs> go do more on top of the mountain. And, and we were like, oh, it's for a photo shoot or it's for a video. And they were like, for what? And we're like, oh, well, we're a food company. And they were like, well, if whatever food you can do, that's going to get you to carry an erg up a mountain. Like, I'm all for it. And <laughs> I didn't, I don't know why I did it, but I packed my backpack full of bars and I guess it was for this reason. I was like, oh, well, if you want a sample, like, here you go. And, and yeah. that in itself, like those very unconventional marketing tactics of like, how can we get 
in front of people and show them like the power of this bar. And so, you know, moving forward, we're, we're hoping to continue sponsoring events, um, both in Calgary and we're trying to do a push into BC as well. Um, so, tar you know, sponsoring races, triathlons, like gravel rides, anything that we can, um, but also doing some of more of these unconventional marketing ideas to kind of really, again, get in front of people, get them to try the bar, get them to see how great it is and how much it will help them. Also how great it tastes. Um, so yep. that's kind of the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Experiential marketing, I think is going to be really key to what you guys are doing. Uh, your, yeah. you know, your success in that and, and getting those products in front. It, it reminds me of the early days of, of, um, you know, some of the energy drinks and, and that kind of thing, right. That, uh, the things that they were doing all the crazy stuff. And, and yeah. I don't remember a rowing machine on the top of a mountain. So that was <laughs> a really good one. Well, and it's about, it's about being in the community in which you're trying to build, you know, around your product as well. Right. And so being a participant within that community really, really helps both in yeah. the social sphere, you know, online sphere, but also in person, obviously when you have a product that needs to be sampled. And so I think that that's a really, really good strategy. And anybody that has a similar, you know, product, maybe different category, different target audience and so on, the key to it is, is building that tribe. And if you can't um, successfully embed yourself within the community or build a community around your product, you're going to have a really hard time then uh, growing your business. And so I think you guys are doing the right things there as well. So <laughs> Yeah, lots of <laughs> lots of really exciting things going on. Um, so let's talk a little bit about. And I know you guys uh, started thinking about this um, business venture in 2019. You said, and then yeah. you launched the bar in September of 2021. Um, yeah. And so it's a pretty new new company, but the, you probably have had some challenges and some obstacles along the way. I'd love to hear any uh, of those challenges that you've had and what you did to overcome those and the lessons you've kind of learned along the way. I don't even know which one to pick. Um, one of the, the very, I would say the biggest first challenge we faced was actually removing a co-founder. Um, we actually started with four people and um, throughout the summer, you know, it was very, everyone was committed and everyone was going and they wanted to keep doing this. And again, at this point where we don't have a business plan, like we don't have an idea, we're testing out an idea to see if it's a, a good idea or not at this point. And kind of once that summer was over and that innovation program we were part of was over uh, very quickly, one of the members of our team, it was very, become very apparent that he kind of wanted to like talk like he just he wanted to I'm an entrepreneur and I'm so great but he didn't actually want to put the work in and yeah like the title but didn't like the work yeah, yeah like yeah. we were really like a entrepreneur is what we we were, were calling him after <laughs> a entrepreneur I, first time I heard that but yeah I like it that's, that's yeah that's and so it was that was a very difficult conversation to have um because he also like I was the only like girl on the team it was me and three guys and I'm kind of like I'm I'm the boss a little bit of in terms of like organization and like what needs to be done and these are our goals how do we hit them and staying on task and so yep. I was always the one who would be like hey you're not doing this hey you're not doing this hey you said you'd have this done and it's not done and it was becoming a big point of contention between the two of us and then there was a little bit of well like you're a woman so I don't have to listen to you was coming in and I <laughs> It was a mess. And uh, that was for me, um, it was a very hard decision because like, we're, you know what, five months into this idea, like it's still not a business. And we had to have a really tough conversation with the rest of us before deciding to like vote, ultimately vote him out. And that was just really hard and difficult. Um, I'm glad we did it. I don't think we would be here today if we hadn't done that. Um, yeah. So that was one is just like, and I guess the moral of that is just like making sure you have the right people around you to support you and, you know, you share the vision and the passion and you're, you're, you both want, or all of you want to be part of it because it was, it was, it was bad. <laughs> it was really yeah. bad. Yeah. Um, well, and that's a, that's a really good point. And it's so difficult in the early days, right? Because everybody has probably the same level of excitement at the beginning and you can exactly. see the potential of where everybody's going to fit into that plan. And, and then you start going and, and, you know, circumstances change, life events change, whatever. Yeah. Uh, there's different priorities all of a sudden uh, crop into people's lives in the startup phase is oftentimes. And so having a mechanism to remove somebody is really important. Did you guys have something formal, uh, like in your partner agreement where you could, 
um, you know, have some mechanism to essentially remove somebody or was it um, something that, it, you know, was a little, much less formal, I guess, in terms of, of setup? Yeah, we had kind of been the innovation program. I don't actually necessarily agree with this, but they were like, you guys need to incorporate immediately and you need to get a shareholders agreement immediately. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't actually just looking back, like I would have definitely had a founder's agreement, but I wouldn't have done all of that. Like, again, this is before, like we're, we're testing out if this is even an idea to pursue. Um, and we had, we hadn't signed a shareholders agreement yet because we were still working out some of the details, but it was there and it was like mostly done. And so essentially what we did is we just assumed we had signed it and kind of followed that protocol because we didn't want any sort of lashback after of like, you know, one day if we make millions to be like, oh, well, technically I still have a quarter for the company. Like we didn't want any of that. Exactly. So we did it very officially. Um, we, we did talk to people like a lawyer to make sure that like, how can we do this? Because nothing had been signed at that point, but we just really wanted to protect ourselves. And so, you know, yeah. we gave him a quarter of our assets at the time. We had him sign like all the release forms and everything. So that was all done. Um, so we, we did, even though nothing was actually signed, we did do it very formally. Um, yeah. Yeah, kind of continue on. which is wise. I mean, you need to protect the future of it, right? So you don't have those claims. Um, I'm just curious. You said that you you didn't agree necessarily with um, getting incorporated right away and the shareholder agreement, um, but you did agree that you would have liked to have had a founders agreement or something like yeah. that initially. So what was it about the uh, advice that you were receiving that you didn't agree with? Just so that um, um, you know our audience can understand that better too. Yeah, I think it was just like, again, this we probably incorporated two months after we had all first met like it was, and it was, again, I guess the the context of this program is like, you know, you have a two week boot camp at the beginning of the summer, and then you have three months, three and a half months to just work on this idea. And they know going into it, like some teams will continue on and some teams will dissolve by the end of the summer. Some yeah. teams will continue on for four months. Some teams will become big companies like, and that's the context of it. And so I think, I think the reason they told us to do that was so that you have that protection of like, if one person decides to leave, but everyone else like decides to continue, you can kind of yeah. work through that. The, the reason I disagree with that is just because you know the context and within our team there so there was four so we we removed one one decided to leave um on his own accord so left on great terms and then Devin and I are still working on the business um but Devin and I were still in school at the time and the other two were done school and they were kind of like I don't know if I want to get a real job I don't know if I want to like give algae a yep. go like I don't really know what I want to do and I mean this is like July and we're talking about September and I think for us it was then we were trying to protect ourselves with like a cliff and a vesting schedule and like how are we going to do this and again like we don't have a business solid business idea yet at this point and so yeah. I think for us it was just it got very complicated and difficult than I think it needed to be and had we just had kind of this very simple founders agreement at the beginning and then kind of moved on and when the time came for a shareholders agreement that was done um, I think that would have been better because it just made things complicated and confusing and difficult when they really didn't need to be. So for everybody's uh, benefit, what would be the difference in your mind between a shareholders agreement and a founders agreement then? Um, good question. I don't actually know that I have like a, a definite answer on that. I think just like as a, a, share, a founders, like the shareholders agreement is like a very legal document. Yeah. You need to be incorporated. It like lays out like if someone dies, if someone gets divorced, if someone like it lays out yeah. every possible situation. And one of the things is we were kind of scared of is like what exactly would happen where someone doesn't put in as much work. And then, you know, yeah. why are they getting compensated the same as like someone else who's putting in like all of their efforts into this. And it, so it, it really considers every single situation. Whereas I think a share, uh, a founder's agreement is a little bit more simple and it's kind of like, you know, I don't need to consider if someone dies right now, because again, we're not even an idea at this point. Um, but just yeah. like, <laughs> here are some very clear overarching statements. I think it's a little bit easier to change and adapt, um, as you kind of grow and as the need arises versus a shareholder's agreement, I feel like is, is one, it's just intimidating in itself because it's a shareholder's agreement, but it's a lot more rigid and, and formal. 
Yeah. So something that's a, a, a little, you know, less formal, a little less in depth, I guess would be the, yeah. the, the difference between the two in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, I think you're right. Like in the early stages, oftentimes, um, you know, just adding extra complexity uh, can be, well, not only, uh, you know, just extra work and, and take extra resources and so on to navigate through all that, but also can be somewhat intimidating too. And so it just as one more thing that it's like, oh, I don't know, is, are we ready for this? Yeah. Or do we want to continue moving forward or whatever. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's important at some point to get those, those agreements in place. So you are protected um, yeah. like you have been. So that's good. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I just really enjoyed uh, hearing your story and the excitement that you bring to, uh, you know, the food industry. And I mean, we didn't get into, um, you know, how you make it and, and all the other things too, which I'd imagine is lots of complexities <laughs> there as well, uh, which uh, maybe we'll have to have you back for, for another um, you know, I, I catch up to see how things are going in six months or a year's time. And, and then we can explore some of those other areas, but I really do thank you for everything that you've shared so far and, and, uh, wish you all the best as you guys are navigating through this. I think you have a really interesting product. It's uh, it's a category unto itself really. And, uh, I think you guys are doing a lot of right things in terms of the marketing and the way that you're exploring, uh, the target audience development and, and product development and everything else. So, uh, good on you guys for for, for doing the things that you're doing. Thank you so much. It was, it was a pleasure to be here. I love talking about my journey and, and inspiring, hopefully inspiring others to kind of start their own journey. So hopefully, hopefully that, that helped someone. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure it would. And uh, thanks everybody for watching this episode. And if you enjoyed this episode, you can check out the rest of the episodes in our archive over at amplifyyourbusiness.ca. And if you have a business that you've started recently or are thinking of starting even, or that you've been running for quite a while, we'd love to have a conversation with you and hear your story, your journey, and uh, tease out some of the lessons as well for our audience. So please reach out if that's the case. Until next time, everybody stay safe. <music>